around my story. I adore detective adventures and solving puzzles that others can't. I'm crazy about this. I love challenges and mysteries. I'm Ramon, but my father's nickname for me is Megamind. I'm 14 years old, and I'm typically ranked number one in my class every year. I have become famous for solving riddles. Many comers have tried to unseat me, but all have failed. I love to examine minute details. But let me get on with telling you my story. One hot summer, we had just finished our exams at school and were going on summer break. So I organized a trip to the beach with my friends. Beach weather is amazing. Clear skies, cool ocean breezes, sand, and sun. Just amazing. One day, before my beach trip, my mother handed me a letter from my grandmother. I was surprised and thought it was a little weird because Granny owned a hotel in the surrounding area nearby. It had wonderful views all around it. I had opened the letter, which read, Dear Ramon, How are you? I hope you're enjoying your summer break. Would you mind spending a couple of days with me? I have a serious matter that I would like to discuss with you. Granny. Initially, I thought that it was probably some silly matter, but then my inner voice told me that it might be important. I was conflicted between going on my beach trip or visiting my granny. I decided to visit granny first. She was family after all. So off I went. Though my grandmother lived in a beautiful area, the closer I got to the hotel, the more my inner voice was nagging me. When I arrived at the hotel, Granny was waiting for me. She smiled and hugged me. I had missed her so much. She had company. Raul, her maintenance man, and Malika, her housekeeper and assistant. There weren't any guests in the hotel at the time, and I asked her why. Her face changed, and she said that was what she wanted to speak to me about. So we went to her room to talk. She then proceeded to tell me that the hotel was haunted. Haunted? I exclaimed. What makes you think that? Granny said, The hotel has evil spirits that frighten the guests at night. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew Granny was a rational person. I suspected there was more to this than meets the eye, so I decided to investigate this intriguing mystery. On my first night at the hotel, I waited until midnight. Then I lit a candle and walked through the halls of the hotel. There were photos on the wall and I could hear whispering and the rustle of the leaves outside. It was a little spooky and unsettling and made my blood run cold. Suddenly, I heard laughing on both sides of the hotel and a shadow passed quickly in front of my eyes. Unnerved, I quickly returned to my room where soon afterwards I heard something scratching on my door. I kept thinking to myself, I am not afraid. I am not afraid. Then the door began opening slowly. I saw a hand on the doorknob. Then the owner of the hand came into view. It was a cloaked, headless man holding a candle. I fainted. The next day, I woke up to find Granny and Malika standing beside me. Granny told me that I had been sleeping a long time. I asked what had happened and they told me they heard me scream and came to my aid. When they found me, I was unconscious on the floor. At that moment, there was a knock on the door. It was Raul bringing me a drink. That was when I noticed something strange about Raul's face. It was emotionless. Then I glanced at his hands as I accepted the drink from him. That night, I again walked around the hotel. I found some steps at the end of a corridor that led to the basement. Down in the basement, I opened a maintenance door and found a tape recorder and a pile of clothes on a table. Suddenly the lights went out. I was groping around in the dark and trying to find my way back when I heard the laughing again. Still, I continued stumbling ahead through the dark. I stepped on an electrical line and tore it off the wall. I returned to my room. My door opened slowly. I was hiding behind the door. I grabbed the loose electrical detonator and touched it to the doorknob. It was live, and I heard a grunt from the owner of the hand on the other side of the door as he or she was shocked, and I heard him or her fall to the floor. It took me a while to find the electrical panel, but I managed to get the lights back on. When I did, I found Raul laying unconscious on the floor next to the doorknob that I had electrified. 
I called Granny and Malika down to the basement. Granny asked what had happened. I replied, Granny, you really need to screen your employees better. Raul was your ghost. Granny looked shocked and asked me what made me think that. I explained that the hand on my drink today was the same hand I saw in the headless ghost that opened my hotel room door the night before. I also found tools, a tape recorder, and some ghost clothes down here in the basement. In addition, I found the earphones that had been placed around the hotel. Granny was shocked. Raul woke up about that time, and she grilled Raul. Why are you scaring all my guests away, Raul? He said, This hotel used to belong to my family, but you bought it from my grandfather. Well, I wanted it back. Please forgive me. Malika said, We have to call the police. But I said, No, wait. I have an idea. Let's renovate and reopen the hotel with a new name. The Haunted Hotel. Our advertising slogan will be, Spend a night in a haunted hotel. Raul can do his ghost thing with the whispers and the laughing. Why, he can even flicker the lights off and on at a random time once or twice a night just to give the hotel a spooky atmosphere. The idea proved to be a big hit. The haunted hotel attracted many tourists and Granny's business prospered. I had a nice holiday and still managed to fit in my trip to the beach on my summer break. Hello everyone, I'm Lauren. Did you ever wonder what it would be like to have your life completely destroyed by someone close to you? Ever thought about what you would do then? I didn't have time to think, because that's exactly what happened to me. It all started two years ago. I lived a quiet life with my mom and dad and my sister. I love my family. We were always together. We were happy. Until that fateful day. My dad got fired from his work. A big company. He had worked there for 20 years. The only money we had then was what he had managed to save over the years. Finding a new job wasn't easy. It was a hard time for all of us. Especially my dad. He was becoming desperate. At times, he just sat there. Quietly. Deep in thought and I rarely saw him smile since. One late night, we were still up waiting for him when he walked through the door, but something was different. He wasn't walking straight. It was the first time in my life seeing him drunk. I decided to take matters in my own hand. I started job hunting. I was lucky enough to find something suitable at a startup company. The pay was good enough, and the more I worked, the more I earned. I was trying my best to get our life back. I was giving it all I've got. My dad started asking me for money. I was more than happy to give him what he needed. I didn't even ask what it was for. Then he started asking for more. He came late almost every night, and he was never awake in the morning. It seemed like we hadn't talked together for ages. Then, money started disappearing from my purse. I got home from work one night. It had been a long day, and I was really tired. I put my bag in my room and I went to the kitchen to find something to eat. I made myself a sandwich, then took it back to my room. But when I got to the door, I saw a shadow moving inside. I thought everyone was asleep, so I opened the door slightly and looked inside. I couldn't believe what I saw. My dad was standing over my bag, and my wallet was in his hand. He found no money in it, so he threw it on the bed and started going through my purse. At that moment, my mom came down the stairs. She had my dad's shirt in her hands and a small pack of white powder. I looked at her face. Her eyes were filled with tears. I tried to speak but found nothing to say. My dad came out of my room. He saw us standing there. Suddenly, everything changed. He tore the shirt and the pack from my mom's hands. He was hysterical. He started breaking things around him. My mom and I were too scared to move. But then my sister came running down the stairs. He pulled her towards him and held a knife to her throat. He threatened to kill her if we didn't give him money. Without a moment's thought, I did what he asked. Things only got worse. Nothing was ever enough. He asked for more and more money, and if I refused, he'd get violent, beating up anyone in his path. I couldn't stand by and watch, so I would just give him what he wanted, until I decided enough was enough. He barged down the stairs one evening, 
and asked for all the money I've got. I told him we had expenses to pay, the rent, school fees, but none of it mattered to him. He asked me again for the money and threatened me if I didn't do what he asked. I refused. He hit me so hard that I crashed my head against the wall and fell to the floor, bleeding. Everything went dark. My mom took me to different hospitals, and I had to do a lot of checkups and tests, but all the doctors said the same thing, that this was it. I was sentenced to live my life in darkness, never to see the light again. Bumping my head against the wall was one of the reasons, but apparently my psychological state played a huge role in my recovery. The doctor suggested that I'd be taken to a psychiatrist. My dad felt sorry for what he had done to me. He quit the drugs and alcohol, tried to be proper, but it was because of him that I was in this state. I didn't know if I could ever find it in myself to forgive him. I was torn inside. He was my dad, but I couldn't forget what had happened. I stopped talking shortly after, and he left, disappearing from our lives. No one knew where he was or what he was doing. A year had passed, and he came home. He sounded good, kind of like how he was before. He's trying to make up for what he had done. But to me, nothing he does makes a difference anymore. I'm still in the dark. That's something I'm going to have to live with my whole life. I can't change that. What do you think I should do? Most people I saw hated and cursed at me, and some treated me more kindly and gently than usual. It was very confusing, to be honest. I didn't know the reason for people's animosity towards me, but I thought perhaps it had something to do with my mother. Before telling my story, let me introduce myself. My name is Maria. I lived in a poor neighborhood fraught with drugs and death. People who lived there were mostly losers growing up. People have always looked at me with disdain for no good reason. People ostracized me. I had no friends, no one to speak to. When I would return home, I'd ask my mother why people didn't like me. She wouldn't answer. She'd just cry and smile sadly. She would often tell me to ignore people's looks. But how can I ignore the looks of everyone around me? It was the biggest mystery in my life. I didn't know if my father was alive or not. The only thing I knew about my father was how he looked from a picture on our wall. And if I asked about him, my mother would only tell me that he traveled and he never came back, that she didn't know anything about him, almost as if he were dead. But I suspected that she wasn't telling me the whole truth and I thought people in our neighborhood knew something I didn't. Perhaps that was the reason they hated me so much. Aside from this problem, I was a clever girl at school. I dreamed of having a good position in life to make my mother proud of me. One day, as I was returning home from school, I felt that someone was following me. I turned around once, but saw no one. The second time I turned around, I saw a man. He was wearing a mask. I was afraid, and I ran home to my mother. She was worried, and she just hugged me. It happened a lot after that. It seemed like everywhere I went, that man just happened to be there. I spent a lot of time thinking about it, who that man could be. Eventually, I graduated and got a job with a well-known company. We left our poor neighborhood and rented a flat in a good area. I had almost forgotten about the mystery man who used to follow me often. Then, one day, a poor man came into my office. He handed me an envelope, smiling, he told me to say hello to Isabella, then disappeared, leaving me with even more questions. Who was he, and how did he know my mother? I returned home, told her about this man, and showed her the envelope. She looked worried, and asked me to quickly open it for her. When I did, I found something unexpected. One old photo of him, and a recent one. I didn't know it then, but that man was my father, and all I did was walk away. I curiously began reading the letter. It said, Dear Maria, I am sorry for everything. Sorry for the suffering I caused you and your mother. Sorry for not being there with you as you grew up. I hope that you can both forgive me. Please tell Isabella that I never forgot about her, or you. I love you two so much. I looked at my mother. She was holding the photographs and crying quietly. So the mystery man who had often followed me home had actually been my father, watching me from afar. I asked my mother, why did you hide the truth from me? Why didn't you tell me where my father was all these years? She replied, I was afraid to shock you with the news that your father was in prison for killing someone. And I gasped, killing someone? Hi, I am Ralph. I am 19 years old. 
I have simple secret that I like my mother. Don't judge me, just listen to my story. I had a quiet family, kind mother and loving father. We had stable lives in our far state. But as you know, there is no place for happy life in our world. There was a turning point in life and it came quickly with me. It was a nice day in our garden, me, my mother and my father. My father was sitting under a tree reading a book. Me and my mother were playing football. Suddenly, mom overshot and the ball went into the street. I was too young to think, I just ran quickly to pick the ball. There was a fast car. The driver was screaming at me, stay away, but I did not. My mother sacrificed herself to rescue me. I fainted and when I woke up, I saw my mother's blood everywhere. My father was crying. There were a lot of people. Our lives changed to be gloomy. He was surrounding me by many looks. I thought he blamed me because of her death. He was so sad. I left my friends. I did not talk with people. I was just eight years old. I was thinking of killing myself. I would like to escape from this blame. Suddenly, my father decided to marry. I shocked because I could not imagine any other woman instead of my mother at home. He said in a firm voice, she will be at home soon. He asked me to be a good boy. I entered my room and started crying. I could not imagine. But I decided to annoy her. When she prepared food, I immediately threw it. Her only reaction was a kind smile. While my father was staying at home, I insisted by bothering her by doing a lot of noisy things. My father was shouting and she always protected me. I said to myself, maybe she is a good woman and she loves me. One time while she was cooking, she had a phone call from the hospital. It was an urgent matter. I was watching TV. She came in to me and said, Ralph, my sister is in the hospital and I have to go. Can you take care of cooking? I did not care. She smiled and went out. I went to the kitchen and turned up the heat to burn the food. But the fire did not just burn the food. It started to burn home too. There was fire everywhere. I could not breathe. Then I fainted. I woke up, but I did not know where am I. I looked around and saw my stepmother sleeping. She looked exhausted, and there was cinder on her face. Suddenly the door opened and I discovered that I was in the hospital. The nurse said, get well soon. I asked her what happened. She told me that there was a big fire at our home and my mother is a brave woman. She entered home and rescued me in the last moment. I looked at her, I discovered that she is a great woman. She woke up suddenly and asked me, are you okay? I hugged her and cried. I said, sorry for everything. She said, it is okay. I can understand. I considered her my mother. I started to help her in everything at home. She helped me a lot. I supported her a lot until her last illness. Today, I'm standing in her gravesite. I want to tell her that I love her a lot. Hey, my name is Rachel. In high school, the homecoming dance was coming up. I happened to confine that I had a crush on a popular guy to another girl in my class. Unbeknownst to me, they were very, very good friends. And this girl offered to put in a good word for me. The next day, she told me my crush would totally say yes if I asked him. So in between periods, I found my crush in the hallway, asked him to the homecoming dance, and he said yes. Well, homecoming is on Saturday. Today is Thursday. My crush, his friend, and I, we went to lunch together and I offered to pay in the hopes that this will make them like me even more. And yes, I was that bad. They tell me they want two bags of chips, burgers, fries, and two small cartons of chocolate milk? No problem. I go to the cafeteria and get those items like a boss. For some reason, I decided to jog over to them, even though that really only shaves off like, what, 10 minutes from my trip? But I still did it. I had two bags of chips in my mouth, one in my hand with a burger and fries, the other hand with two cartons of chocolate milk. They are sitting in the common area. The common area is carpeted parallel to the cafeteria which had a tile floor, 
These rooms are separated by a relatively small metal line on the floor, and as I meet that line, my left foot catches on the metal. No problem, I have another foot. I will just swing that foot forward real quick and save this. But no, the other foot also catches. As I fall straight forward, I try to catch myself with my hands. Well, one hand had the chocolate milk in it, which just burst out, sending chocolate milk in every single direction. My other hand didn't help me either. It slipped on the burger in the bag and the fries go all over the place. The last thing to break my fall was actually my own face. The face with two bags of potato chips in my mouth. You know those jokes about chips bags being full of air? Well, they're actually true. As my face collided with the ground, both the bags of chips exploded at the same exact time and it sounded like a gunshot. Somehow one of my shoes just flew off. I tried to melt into the ground and fade out of existence for a moment and this happened at the meeting point of the common room and the cafeteria. So everyone in both rooms either saw or heard this fiasco and looked over. About a hundred students. It's deadly silent for a couple of seconds and then comes the laughter. And dear god the laughter. It was like a jet engine. Every person there was laughing the hardest they have ever laughed in their whole lives. I even saw the janitor doubled over laughing, bracing himself with a mop handle. A teacher was trying to walk over to help me, but she stopped every couple of feet to use her whole body to laugh at me. All of this happens not 10 feet away from the table in which my crush and his friends were sitting. Everyone is having a great laugh, but my crush has the greatest laugh of all. He has fallen to the ground, with one hand bracing himself on his knees. The other hand is clutched at his ribs as he laughs so hard that no sound comes out. He was wheezing like a dolphin. There is no recovery from this. I walk to the bathroom to clean myself up. The teacher could only manage to hand me my shoe along the way and continue laughing. In the bathroom, the laughter did not die at all for what seemed like a lifetime. When the bell rang, I was still in the bathroom and people were still laughing. While I spent the whole day wallowing in easily the most embarrassing moment of my life, I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'm just a funny girl and he will like it. The next morning, I see my crush before class and he walks up to me and he says, so homecoming is tomorrow. Eager not to speak about the shit show that happened yesterday, I just excitedly said, yes, yes it is. And then he delivers a crisp and says, um, so this girl that I actually like asked me to go to the dance with her, so I think I'm gonna go. To which I replied, um, ah, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I totally did not go in the bathroom and cry after that. Anyways. My crush said he will go to homecoming with me. The day before, I tripped with his lunch and face planted into a pool of random ingredients in front of the entire class. My crush did not go to the homecoming dance with me. Hey everyone, my name is Gwen. My story is different from anything you've ever heard before in your life. We all have grandparents, and we all love them very much. When they die, they leave an empty space in our hearts. It's never easy. My grandpa died a year ago. Before he died, he left me an old weird looking chest, which I never thought to open before, until today. I opened the chest, but all I found in it were two pieces of paper. One of them had only two words, Grandpa's house, and the other had a map drawn on it. I thought for a while, then I decided to go to my grandpa's old house and check things out. So, I went to the house. As I took out the key to open the door, the door opened wide. There was no one else there. I was scared, but I was curious to find out more about the map. So I went in. As soon as I got inside, the door slammed shut behind me. I was shocked and scared, but I wasn't going to back out now. The house looked so creepy and eerie, like it was abandoned for a hundred years. And it felt so cold. Cold, like standing on ice. I opened the map in my hands and looked around. 
It showed the inside of the house. I followed the path till I reached a door. When I stood in front of it, it opened slowly on its own. Terrified, I took two steps back, but I glimpsed a shadow inside, so I moved forward. I stepped in, but with nothing under my feet, I fell, rolling over down the stairs. It wasn't a room, it was the basement. I tried to get up, but there was something on my legs. Of course, it was too dark to see what it was. Every time I take it off, it falls back again. I looked for my phone, but it wasn't in my pocket. Oddly enough, when I looked again, it was there. I took it out, and I turned on the flashlight. And there was my surprise. On my legs was the bony arm of a skeleton. I kicked it away and stood up quick. I lit around the room with my phone, but it was full of skeletons all over. Of course, no need to tell you I was scared the heck out of my wits. What happened next was beyond the understanding of an average person. The eyes of one of the skeletons turned bright red, and they were staring right at me. My feet started moving backwards automatically, and I found two bony hands clasping my neck. I freaked out. But then, suddenly, all the skeletons moved and stood in two lines, clearing a path for me. The map in my hand was glowing and indicating a place in the room. I moved towards it, slowly as my knees buckled together. There was a huge chest. When I opened it, I found a ton load of money. Strangely enough, all the skeletons had disappeared, and the furniture in the room was floating around the air. I got scared, and I ran for it. But I came to the stairs, and I found the door locked. It wouldn't open. The skeletons appeared around me once again, and they were pulling me off the stairs. I soared through the air and landed on the chest. Then I was out cold. When I came to, I found myself inside the chest, like it was a coffin of some sort, and I was lying inside, feeling numb all over. I could see the sky, but it was cloudy. I felt like I was being buried. Then I heard a voice. It said, Welcome to your grandpa's treasure. This is what happens to people like me. Dumb people like me who follow a stupid map to look for their grandpa's worthless treasure. They'll tell you their stories from their graves. A Vindictive Ghost Love is the biggest treasure in my life. Good memories, exciting adventures, happiness, sadness, dreams. All these matter and help people endure suffering in their lives. My name is Alex. I'm 18 years old and currently in the 12th grade. I used to live in a small remote village with my parents. I was their only child. My parents raised me well, educated me, and taught me good manners. I see the fruits of their labor in me in every difficult situation I face. For example, after I was murdered, I knew exactly what to do. Intrigued? Are you eager to hear my story? Let's go. When my father received a promotion, we moved from our small village to the big city. I had many nice memories of that little remote village. I had many friends there that I used to play, joke, and laugh with. I feel like I left half of my soul in that village. My father bought us a nice home in a quiet neighborhood. I liked the place the moment we arrived. Our neighbors were nice, and they offered to help us move in. I liked them all. I felt that I would make many new friends in my new neighborhood. One day, I went to the supermarket to buy some necessities for my mum, when suddenly, I bumped into a girl named Rachel. We were coincidentally buying the same item, and there was only one left. I got to it first, but seeing that she wanted it also, like a true gentleman, I offered it to her instead. Initially, she politely declined, but then she gladly accepted my kind gesture in the end. I ended up walking her home and discovered that she was my neighbor. I fell in love with her at first sight. Once we arrived at her home, we said goodbye and she said she would see me tomorrow. I wanted time to pass quickly so I could see her again. As I was walking to school the next day, I met her along the way and we walked together. I was overjoyed. After arriving at school, she introduced me to her friends and then I went to my class. The teacher's aide welcomed me and directed me to my class. When I entered the class, I was surprised to see Rachel there. She was in my class. 
I entered the class and sat in a desk on the last row. During a class break, Rachel was sitting with her friends. When she saw me sitting alone, she left her friends and came over and sat with me. Suddenly, a boy named Mario, older than us, entered the class with a group of his cohorts. They looked like a gang of thugs to me. He said to me, Hey you, if you want to live, you'd best stay away from Rachel. Rachel seemed afraid and was visibly shaking at this point. I told him, if you're trying to pick a fight, creep, I'm ready. He grabbed me by my collar and threw me onto a desk, then turned around and quickly left. Rachel explained, he wants to date me, but it'll only happen in his dreams. Rachel and I spent a lot of time together at school, but we weren't safe from Mario's bullying. One day, we decided to go to a rocky hillside to sit beside the river and watch the sunset. I got our bikes ready and off we went down the road, laughing and talking. I had decided before this trip that I would tell her about my love for her. I chose this trip to tell her because it seemed like it would be an unforgettable moment, and it really was. After we arrived, I looked into her eyes, kneeled down on my knees, and gave her a present. Then I said, I love you, Rachel. She was surprised, to say the least, and put her hand over her mouth. Then I suddenly heard a camera flash and a voice say, Cut! Let's repeat this scene again. I looked around to see Mario and his gang. One of them was holding a camera. I shouted angrily, What are you doing here? If you want to fight, I'm ready, but leave Rachel alone. I heard Rachel laughing, and it sent a chill down my spine, for she wasn't laughing in a joyful manner, but in a mocking one. Then she began clapping her hands and said, You are really brave, Alex, but you are also an idiot. I froze. I couldn't believe my eyes when Rachel walked over and stood beside Mario, smiling. Mario said, if you had asked around, you would have known that Rachel and I always welcome new students this way. You're our sucker of the week. I spat out, you're all pigs. I punched him in the face and he counterpunched me in the stomach. He said, do you realize how stupid you are? I spit in his face and he became enraged and pulled me towards him by my collar. Rachel tried to stop him. He threw me into the river. The last thing I remember as my head went under the water was Mario's derisive, self-satisfied laughter. When I woke up, I was lying on a wooden bed with an old man sitting beside me. He told me that I had been unconscious for four days. I asked him where I was and how I had gotten there. He told me that he found me unconscious floating in the river and that he had rescued me, saved me from drowning. I thought, oh my god, my parents must be so worried about me. I tried to get up and felt an excruciating pain that stopped me. I saw that my leg was broken and that the stranger had bandaged it as best he could. I asked him to call my family. He said he had no telephone, but he offered to visit my family and tell them what had happened and that I was okay. I told him that I would be so grateful if he could do so. I accepted his offer and thanked him. He returned with a newspaper in his hand and had a sad look on his face. I read the paper which said that I was presumed dead, having drowned in the river because they couldn't find my body. I was angry at Rachel and Mario, and also worried for my parents at the same time. I asked the man to please take me home. Then I crept into my home to see my parents sleeping. They were holding a photo of me and looked sad. I didn't wake them, but rather snuck over to Rachel's house. She was speaking on the phone, so I eavesdropped. She was saying, I didn't expect this to happen, but it's all good. Maybe he's in a better place now. What an idiot and a fool he was. Then she laughed. I was pretty upset to hear her mocking laughter without any regret whatsoever of being involved in causing my death. I returned home and encountered my father in the bathroom. When he saw me, he was initially startled and incredulous. But then I hugged him, and he began crying tears of joy. Then mother woke up, and I hugged her too. They asked me what had happened, and I told them everything, but I asked them not to reveal that I wasn't dead yet. They asked me why, and I told them I would explain later. I decided to exact some sweet revenge on my would-be murderers. That night, I tacked a letter on Rachel's front door. The next day, she found it and read it. The scribbly handwriting said simply, I'm coming for you. It was signed, Alex's ghost. After reading it, she immediately looked around to see if anyone was nearby who might have delivered the letter, but there was no one in sight. I sent this same letter to Mario and to each of his gang members too. 
I sent these letters on a daily basis for several days. Then one day, I took my scheme to the next step. I sent a letter to Mario with Rachel's forged signature and a letter to Rachel with Mario's forged signature. The letters told them to meet each other at the same site where they had killed me. I was hiding in the trees when they arrived. Rachel asked Mario, why did he want to meet me here? He replied, me? You asked me to meet you here. Rachel denied that she had done any such thing. Suddenly, I walked slowly out from the trees and said, I am the vindictive spirit of Alex's soul, and I have come to take my revenge on you two murderers. Suddenly frightened, they got down on their knees and pleaded with me to forgive them, and they said, We threw you in the river, but we didn't mean to kill you. It was an accident. Then a police car siren sounded, and a police car's blue lights began flashing, and several policemen came out from hiding in the trees. Having heard Mario and Rachel's confession, the police took them into custody. As Mario and Rachel were being escorted away, I said to them, Now who's stupid, idiot? My name is Ricardo. Though I am a 21-year-old, my body is the size of a 10-year-old boy because I was born with a disease called Prader-Willi Syndrome, PWS, which stunted my body growth while allowing my mind to continue developing. Most people would consider PWS to be a curse, but it was a gift for Dad and me because we took advantage of this situation. My story starts when Dad's company accused him of embezzlement and fired him. The scandal and shame of this incident kept him from getting any other type of work, so we left our country to start a new life elsewhere. Dad was still unable to get a job because his old company always gave him bad references when called by prospective new employers. Dad was worried about our future, so he improvised and came up with a scheme to turn me into the goose that laid the golden egg. You see, children always bullied me due to my small body size. Luckily, my mature mind helped me avoid fights most of the time. One day, Dad asked me if I wanted to become famous, and I said, sure. He told me that we needed a way to gain people's sympathy, and he explained his plan. We went to the garage and found some old torn clothes that he asked me to wear. Then he poured dirty water on me. Then he made a recording of me crying and explaining that I had been beaten by some bullies in our neighborhood. After we finished making our sympathy garnering video, he applauded my performance and posted it to the internet to see what reaction we would get. The next day, our video went viral and I became an instant celebrity. All the news agencies gave the video broad coverage, and I began receiving sympathetic phone calls and donations from around the world. Several international schools offered me free scholarships at their schools, and I managed to amass a good size of money from all the donations, and for a moment, I thought our days of poverty were finally over. Unfortunately, the authorities investigated my background and found that I was 21 years old and not really a kid at all. Then, all my fortunes reversed themselves, and the police came after me for fraud. I am speaking to you now from a hotel room as I hide from the police. I have enough money to head to another country, preferably one that has no extradition treaty with my country. I have enough money to live comfortably without needing to work for the rest of my life. So, on balance, I don't have any regrets about what I've done. My name is Keanu, and I'm 13 years old. I am a psychopath. I freely admit it in front of all of you. I attribute my sickness solely to my father, because any story about a cruel father pales in comparison to my father. He would abuse me physically, mentally, verbally, and emotionally in every given moment. He left no stone unturned in this regard. He would beat me into unconsciousness. He accused me of being the cause of my mother's death, who died during my childbirth. Whenever Dad had any problem at home, he would accuse me of being the cause of it. One time he even beat me at school when my teacher called him to school because I had beat up my classmate who had beaten me up first. I tried to explain to him, but he wouldn't listen and he just beat me even more. One day, it was fun day at school and everyone was supposed to invite their parents to visit the school for party and introduction activities. I chose not to invite my dad 
So I was alone at the festivities. I felt envious of all my classmates for having loving parents to have fun with. My teacher noticed me alone, came over and offered to be my parent for the day. I was so happy. We had great fun together. Miss Linda had lost both her husband and her son in a plane crash. Only, she had survived. After fun day had passed, Miss Linda showed more interest in me. She would bring me sandwiches and spend time with me during breaks. I thought of her as my mom. When I succeeded in my final exams, she hugged me with tears of joy. I unconsciously said, Thanks, Mom. I went home happy that day, but had to face my dad again. He asked me why I was late coming home, and I told him about having to pass my final exams. He didn't believe me, though, and asked me to show him proof. Unfortunately, I had none, so he began kicking and punching me. There was a knock on the door. He tried to block me from opening the door, but I managed to open it. Miss Linda was standing there. She glanced at my bruises and bloody face and moved between me and my dad to protect me from further abuse. Dad snarled and threatened her with a beating if she didn't leave immediately. But she hit him in the eyes with a blast of mace or pepper spray, and he went down to the floor in extreme discomfort, grabbing at his eyes. Miss Linda called the police, told them about Dad's child abuse of nature, and had him arrested. Now I live with Miss Linda as my new mom. Dad is in prison, where I hope he stays till he dies or rots. Either outcome is okay with me. This time, you get to know the truth about the haunted piano. I left. I went to work. Then I came home and went to bed. Everything was back to normal just as I told myself it was. Music started playing again. That's when it hit me. This was not paranormal. It couldn't be. It was a cheap trick. Margaret must have programmed the piano to play itself. It was just a prank. A laugh at my expense. That's why the damn thing was free. I ran downstairs to solve the mystery once and for all. Like clockwork. As soon as my foot touched the bottom step, the piano stopped playing. I walked over to it, confident in my new theory. Upon opening it up and exploring all of it, I was surprised by what I saw. It was just a normal piano. Nothing extra was added in its creation to make it play on its own. My calmness was not calm anymore. I stared at the red wood and ivory keys before me and almost felt compelled to ask, what are you? Instead, I remained silent. This silence, however, was quickly interrupted by the sound of music as the piano began playing itself once again. I wanted to run, but fear kept me still. I watched the horror unfold. The keys were being pressed down hard, controlled by an unseen force. A haunting piece filled the room as pictures fell from the walls. The house began to shake around me. My eyes darted back and forth in fear. But then I noticed something outside. Standing at my window was a shadowy figure. I ran outside to escape the madness. All the while the song went on. The house continued to shake behind me. The dark figure was nowhere to be seen. Margaret has not rigged the piano to play on its own but I was not losing my marbles either. This was something entirely different, something out of this world. All at once, the music stopped playing, and the world around me with it. No wind, no cars, no animals, and no people. Nothing. It was the middle of the night at this point, but where were the crickets, the frogs, or even the trees? Where was life outside my home? A little exploration revealed that I was truly by myself. Every living creature in the world had disappeared. What the hell was going on? Why was this happening? I returned home, hoping for answers, but instead, I saw an unsettling sight. It was so dark. I almost didn't see it. Standing completely still next to the piano was the same silhouette from my window. My body was shaking with fear, but the figure did not react. 
It was frozen like the rest of the world. The shadow was wearing a dark cloak, one that covered its entire body. At its face was nothing but pure darkness. I studied the figure for a few more moments before a familiar sound filled the room. The piano song played, and in an instant, the world returned to life. I fell to the ground, but managed to escape crawling out the front door and rushing over to my car. I got in and took off with no specific location in mind, happy to be anywhere that was not my own home. I started weighing my options. Destroying the piano came to mind, but the risk outweighed the reward. It could just as easily backfire, angering whatever spirit was haunting its keys. Seeking help wasn't really an option either. The only person who might believe me was Margaret. That was it. Margaret. Maybe she would know what to do. It was late, but I didn't care. I drove over to her place. The dark figure was there, standing at her door. Before I could turn in the opposite direction, it grabbed me by the arm with its bony fingers. Its strength kept me anchored in place and then it disappeared. I had no choice but to return home. I hesitantly stepped past the piano and walked up to my bedroom, where I locked the door and fell into bed, mentally exhausted. I would not have even a moment of peace. As the song started up again, the second my head hit the pillow. But I remained still, sick of the repetition. The banging on my bedroom door that followed, however, succeeded in freaking me out. I jumped out of bed and pushed my dresser to the door, and I hid under my sheet. The banging persisted, but I chose to instead focus on the song, allowing myself to properly listen to it for the first time. Surprisingly enough, it was beautiful. Dark, but beautiful. Its melody soothed me relaxing me to the point that my eyes grew tired. I fell asleep and I had a dream. The dream world I found myself in was different. It was overwhelmingly vivid and real. Words like surreal and otherworldly just don't cut it. The awareness I had is also difficult to explain. I was completely aware of my surroundings in the sense that I could feel everything about them. I know that doesn't make much sense, but it's the only description I have to offer. The dream was in a forest. It was large, and at center, a large red tree stood tall. Every fiber of my being knew where I was. This was the blood tree, the precursor to my piano. As I admired the beauty of the blood tree, a person stepped out from behind. He did not speak. He simply pointed at the tree. This is when the piano leaked into my dream. The song played as glowing lines ran up and down the tree's bark. The man put his hand to the wood, motioning for me to do the same. And I did. It was an incredible sensation. My eyes were filled with visions, a glimpse into the blood tree's past. Its bark wasn't always red. Native habitats came up to the tree every year. They would slice their hands open and place them on the tree's trunk. Their blood then dripped to its base, representing the lifelines of their people. It also signified becoming one with nature, feeding the tree life from within. It was the anchor that kept their community together. This is where they gathered and enjoyed life. A place free from worry. A safe place. This was also where the native buried their dead. After that, one of the elders would play a song. The same song my piano played every night. It was their song of death. When it was all over, a final offering of blood was taken from the fallen and painted on the blood tree, granting their spirit safe passage to the afterlife. When the vision stopped, my new friend released his hand from the bark, 
and pulled out an unusual instrument. He began playing the song of death, but then stopped. He handed it to me and motioned for me to play instead. I wasn't sure what he was up to, but felt no need to deny his wishes. With little practice, I was able to get the hang of the instrument and play the song. As I played, the blood tree began wilting, its bark changing from red to black. My friend was ecstatic. For one reason or another, this is what he wanted. It wasn't until I woke up later in bed that the pieces of the puzzle clicked into place. Margaret's grandfather had taken away the native's headstone. He violated their connection to nature as well as with one another. The tree and its spirits had to be put to rest, and once and for all, there was only one way to do this. I can't explain how, but I knew I needed to play the song of death on the piano. The whole way through, without interruption. It was the only thing that would break the curse. I ran downstairs and put my plan into action. When my hand touched the keys, the house violently shook, knocking frames and furniture all over the place. I kept my composure. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw the dark figure, standing at my window again. Still, I continued. I had an obligation to preserve, if not for the tree or its ghosts, then for myself. The nightmare had to end. They roamed around the room, sometimes next to me, other times breathing down my neck. I paid no attention on the outside, but my bones were shaking. I had come too far to lose my balance now. Just as the shadowy figure sat next to me at the piano, I struck the final note of the song. The madness around me stopped. I turned to the figure beside me, and it was the native for my dream. He threw me a thankful smile before vanishing. My work was done. Months have passed, and the piano remains in my living room, quieter than it's ever been before. I even play it from time to time. If there's one thing you can take away from my experience, it's to be mindful of the things that make sounds at night. Try your best not to be frightened. And please let this tale be a warning to you. Don't ever buy strange things from Craigslist. You'll thank me later. Before this summer, I had zero experience with dating apps. Tinder wasn't even released until two years after my long-term relationship ended. During seven years of my relationship, I had played around on my friends' apps, but never swiped left or right. Finding myself suddenly single at the beginning of the summer, and in desperate need of distraction, I dove headfirst into the pool of online dating. I started with Tinder, because my town is too small for anything else, and my cold dead heart wanted casual dates and nothing serious. And that's the whole purpose of Tinder. Tinder met most of my expectations. I went on a handful of dates, met some cool guys, and some not-so-cool guys. I even hung out with a few truly interesting people, like a radio DJ who runs a wedding business on the side. What I did not expect from Tinder, however, was how most of these interactions started to make me feel good about myself. I mean really good about myself. Like every woman in the world, I have never been happy with my body. At a size 10, I'm labeled plus size and I've worn glasses on and off throughout my whole life. When I'm out with my girlfriends, I'm never the girl who is hit on, flirted with, or even picked up. Ever since I hit puberty and became aware of attractive versus unattractive, I've thought of myself as filling the role of the fat friend that just sits back and smiles. Obviously, I've had boyfriends, but they've always been my friends first. So when they said you're gorgeous, what I heard was, I found you gorgeous only after getting to know you. I didn't immediately think you were pretty. I know that having someone attracted to your personality is way more important than thinking you're cute. But I wouldn't hate having just one guy who doesn't know me at all tell me that I'm attractive. Friends, family, and boyfriends, I don't believe. But a total stranger? 
that person I might actually listen to. This brings us back to Tinder. One of my first nights using the app, a friend and I sat on my back deck and decided who to swipe left and right on. With each it's a match, we laughed and looked into the guy's profile a bit more. After the third match, I said, These guys are just judging me on my appearance, right? And my friend nodded. So they're only swiping because they think I'm cute? Or are they just swiping on every girl? We concluded that obviously some of the guys were swiping right on every girl. But the chances of every single guy doing that were slim. We swiped some more. When I started matching with guys who were classically good looking, well, I won't lie, that felt really good. A hog guy actually thinks that I'm attractive? What? No. How could that be? Then the messages started. Some guys went right in with, you're really pretty. Others went in for a conversation first before giving out compliments here and there. I know that this is how people operate on Tinder, but keep in mind that I'm not used to anything. It wasn't until I started meeting with these guys that I wondered, can Tinder actually boost my self-esteem? Two guys asked how someone as pretty as me was still single. I went on a date with one guy who told me in Spanish that I was beautiful. Another guy who I'd met up with a few times asked me, are you looking for something serious? I laughed like a loon in response. It wasn't the question that surprised me. It was the fact that I was coming for an incredibly attractive, incredibly fit guy. Because yes, I'm being shallow and only swiping right on guys who I find physically attractive. When I was done laughing, I said something awkward like, Oh, maybe? I mean, I'm not against it. My mind, however, was saying, Are you serious? Have you seen yourself? Have you seen me? I was in fact not attractive but I simply knew how to dress well. I retreated into my unhealthy shell. Soon after that guy, I hung out with a sweet, nerdy medical student who was in town on a vacation. We got along well. The next day as we met up again, he seemed shocked that I was on a second date. He kept repeating, You're just so beautiful. I never get to do things like this. I don't know how to respond to compliments. And the medical boy shook his head. He said, don't do that. Don't body shame yourself. You're so attractive. Have you seen yourself? You're gorgeous. Something about that guy made my typical self-hate thoughts start to lose hold. Again, I know that this is the type of stuff people say on Tinder. But let's be honest, why put in the extra effort? Unless it's true. Somewhere between the casual Tinder chats, the handful of dates, my mind circled a new thought. Am I attractive? I stared at myself in my full-length mirror. I tried to see what these guys saw. Guys who did not know me at all. Guys who are not being swayed by my personality. And guys who have no reason to compliment me because I'm not looking for another relationship anytime soon. Suddenly I started to see it. Where I used to see unsightly lumps and a stomach I sucked in before turning off the lights, now I see a healthy, curvy, and dare I say it, slender body. Friends, family, and boyfriends have always told me that I'm attractive, but it wasn't until these strangers started repeating it over and over that I actually started to hear it. So which is boosting my self-esteem? Tinder or just plain dating? Or are they working in with one another because without Tinder, I probably wouldn't be dating at all. Romantically, I tend not to put myself out there. I typically wouldn't approach a guy and try flirting with him, for fear of rejection of course. With Tinder however, just matching with someone seems to lessen the fear of rejection. Whether you matched with them because they're genuinely interested, or you matched because they're saying yes to everyone, Seeing that it's a match message eases a tiny bit of the tension that goes into dating. Whether it's thanks to Tinder or not, in the past few months I've discovered newfound confidence. When someone compliments me, I say thank you instead of responding with a self-hatred joke. When I meet a date for the first time, 
I work at being my usual chatty, sarcastic self rather than being shy and quiet. I have flirted with guys and even gave a random musician my number. For once in my life, I feel like I'm someone worth dating rather than fearing 